Um, thank you. And let me, let me start by uh, asking how many of you ran the marathon yesterday? <laughs> and how many of you did not want to get out of bed this morning? <laughs> it was warm out there, wasn't it? I mean, for London, yeah. I saw a lot of people uh, struggling, and, um, but it was glorious. So what I am, I uh, run marathons, but I also run what are called ultra marathons. And in Latin, ultra means beyond. So an ultra marathon is anything beyond a marathon. And a marathon, for us marathoners know, uh, is 26.2 miles. Never used to be that way, and I'll explain why. But right now, um, since 1908, the distance has been 26.2 miles. So the people that had their hands raised, uh, they ran that distance yesterday. So congratulations. So I'll tell you that this is a show called The David Letterman Show, and it was filmed in New York City. I got a request to be on David Letterman, and the thought of being on stage with a celebrity like that was so intimidating to me. Uh, it was overwhelming, but I thought, you know, you have two weeks before you're due to be on the show, and in that two-week time frame, they'll probably give you extensive media training. There'll be um, dry runs. They'll let you know the questions David will be asking in advance, and they'll help me prepare the answers. Well, a week goes by, I haven't heard from anyone. Uh, two weeks go by, and all of a sudden I found myself on, a, on an airplane from San Francisco, my home city, to New York City. And they picked me up at the airport, and they kind of whisked me around in this sleep deprived, you know, kind of jet lagged state. And then at 6 o'clock at night, they bring me to the back entrance of the Letterman studio. And they take me up to this thing they were calling the green room which was beige, <laughs> and they put me in this room and they say, you know, sit down, Dean, uh, sit on the couch, uh, relax, you know, have some food. And I'm not so relaxed. I'm thinking, you know, the, the training, the, the briefings, the dry run, when are we going to get to all these things? And then eventually two of David's, what they call handlers, walk in the room. And these handlers sit down with me and they say, okay, Dean, here's what you've got to do. When you're on the show tonight, don't make any reference to it being Monday night because your segment's going to air on Wednesday night. I said, well, yeah, okay, I can do that. You know, what, what's next? And they said, that, that's about it. And they walked out. And now I'm in there kind of looking at my watch, freaking out a bit, thinking, that, you know, the training, the dry run. And then two more people come in, and they ask me to stand up. So I stand up, and like any runner does, I start shaking my limbs loose, you know, for the, the big training program. And these two people, they kind of look me up and down. One rubs his chin, looks at the other one, and they say, yeah, the guy looks fine to me. And they walked out. <laughs> I don't know who they were. <laughs> and now I'm just I'm really, really anxiety ridden. I'm thinking the training, the dry, you know, the dry run. I hear on the loudspeaker, ultra marathon man, we need you at stage level immediately. And this door swings open and there's a guy standing there. And he walks me down this stark white hallway, this nondescript hallway with like these fluorescent lights overhead. And we get in a freight elevator. We go down a couple stories. Uh, the door opens, there's another guy standing there. The first guy hands me the second guy. The second guy kind of prays me around a corner and there's a third guy. And I notice the third guy has a headset on and when he sees me walking toward him, he says, three, two, one, you're on. I'm like, what? <laughs> and he said, go, everyone's waiting for you. So I kind of stammer out, I'm not sure what to expect. And I come around the corner and wham! I'm just blinded by these huge white stage lights. I mean, I can't see anything but this, this fog of white, and I hear laughter and applause. It was like I was in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm sitting there frozen like a, you know, a deer in the headlamps, and I look to my left, and there was David Letterman with his hand outstretched. And it's funny, I wasn't supposed to run. I was supposed to just sit there as the segment ended, but they didn't really tell me, so I have this motto, you know, when all else fails, get up and start running. So I just got up and ran out of the studio. Um, but anyway, that, that tells you a little bit about who I am. Uh, that was 10 years ago when my first book came out. Um, 10 years uh, later, I haven't really stopped running uh, since that point. And the story I'm going to tell you today is about uh, the origins of the marathon. So this is my fourth book, and I think in a lot of ways my most personal book because I'm 100% Greek. And my dad has always insisted we're from the same 
a village in the mountains of Greece as uh, Phidippides or Phidippides, um, the famous Greek runner. Um, I always tell him, Dad, I grew up in L.A. Like, what village in Greece are you referring to? Uh, but it's been a, it was a very fascinating uh, journey to go down, and I think I'll share it with you today. I think that's why I'm here. Uh, you probably are thinking that you're listening to Dean Carnassus speaking, correct? My name is actually Constantine Nicholas Carnassus. So that gives you some indication I'm Irish. <laughs> um, but uh, how many of you, marathoners especially, know the definition of the word marathon? Probably you have an idea, right? I mean, I think most people define a marathon as anything of excruciatingly long duration, uh, like marathon sessions of Congress or, or Parliament here, or marathon traffic jams. Uh, but a marathon will tell you, how, what is a marathon? It's a foot race of 26.2 miles, correct? And that's the definition. The actual definition is uh, field filled with fennel, uh, fennel the wild herb. And the reason being is that in 490 BCE, uh, the Persians invaded Greece and they landed at this coastal plain that was covered in wild fennel, which grows all over Greece, hence Marathon. Uh, so when people say, you know, they have those bumper stickers that say 26.2, um, they should actually read fennel, because <laughs> that's the definition of the word marathon. Um, we also know the story of this gentleman, Phidipides, that supposedly ran from the battlefield of Marathon to the Acropolis uh, after the Athenians somehow defeated the Persians. Uh, that distance is 24.8 miles, and I'll get to that later on. But he ran 24.8 miles to the Acropolis, proclaimed, Nike, Nike, or you know, victory, victory, Nike, Nike, we are victorious. And then what happened to him? He died, right? Yeah, he died. Um, but there's more to the story than that. Um, he was actually a, a class of citizen known as a hemodrome, which meant day-long runner. He was a professional foot messenger. And the Greeks realized that in the mountainous uh, terrain of southern Greece, uh, a trained hemodrome could outrun a horse. And I know this to be true because I've actually raced a horse over a 100-mile foot race um, in the mountains of Vermont, and I beat the horse. So um, there's some debate about the actual translation of his name, Phidipides, meaning spare the horse, presumably because a trained runner could not kill off a horse. We'll send a runner instead. Um, you know, I was fascinated with this story. And I wanted to learn more about it. But the first thing I wanted to learn is what must it felt like running in that costume that he's wearing? So I visited a Hollywood costume store and I was outfitted with a hoplite running suit. And I decided I would tackle uh, the Silicon Valley Marathon. And I will tell you, after doing that, I think I know why he died. <laughs> Uh, it was, there was some chafing, uh, there was blistering, where the sun don't shine, and I also ran barefoot, and only about half of that course was on man-made natural uh, dirt surfaces. The rest was on a road, as you see here, so my feet were pretty, pretty beat up. Uh, I did see a gentleman running barefoot yesterday uh, on the marathon as well, and he was in the medical tent. So I don't think he, his journey ended with a medal around his neck, unfortunately. But running barefoot, is, uh, especially on uh, man-made surfaces, is very difficult. Um, after this, you know, I completed this race, I thought, okay, I did everything Fidipides did. Um, I'm you know, one with my, my ancient brother. Um, but I learned something. I was on a webinar with a gentleman by the name of uh, Professor Paul Cartledge from Cambridge University. And Dr. Cartledge explained to me that what he did was actually go much further than just running from Marathon to the Acropolis. The historical record says that when the Persians invaded the Athenians, they realized they were badly outnumbered and they were going to be slaughtered. So they needed reinforcements. And if you know anything about ancient Greece or you've seen the movie 300, you know, who's the most badass fighting force in ancient Greece? The Spartans. You know, this is Sparta. So they dispatched Phidippides to run from Athens to Sparta. And that distance is 153 miles. So it's much further than the distance from Marathon to the Acropolis. Uh, I also learned that there is a modern day incarnation of that race called the Spartathlon. 
and it basically follows the footsteps uh, of Pheidippides from Athens to Sparta. So I signed up to do this race, and this is what the starting line looks like. Uh, we're at the base of the Acropolis there, uh, and there were 350 runners in the race that year. Uh, there were 47 different countries represented, and it's the most elite of the elite ultramarathoners. It's very hard to gain entrance to actually uh, be able to compete in this race. Um, you can see some of the terrain here is beautiful, but it's, it's very, very mountainous. Uh, the race is also held in September in southern Greece, uh, so it's very, very hot and humid. Uh, another thing that makes this race so difficult is that it tries to stay within the historical record of milestones that Herodotus, the father of history, recorded Pheidippides being at at certain points during his run. Um, you have to be at a city called Corinth, uh, which is 50.22 miles from the start, within nine and a half hours of the starting gun going off, or else you're eliminated from the race. And those of you that know marathoning, I mean, that's two back-to-back -back marathons uh, in very hot, um, mountainous conditions, um, each of those being, you know, around a, a four-and-a-half-hour marathon or sub-four-and-a-half hours. And the thing is, you don't want to be there anywhere close to nine-and-a-half hours because those aggressive cutoffs continue the entire duration. Uh, what they have is this thing they call the death bus, and it drives along as a sweep, and anyone that doesn't make the cutoff has to get into this bus. And I heard the bus was horrible. I heard there's, you know, moaning and groaning in there. There's blisters, uh, and it doesn't smell very good. So I thought, you know, just stay ahead of these cutoff times because you do not want to get in this bus. The other thing with this race is that you have to complete it within 36 hours because the historical record from Herodotus says that Pheidippides arrived in Sparta the day after setting out, which can be interpreted as he left one morning, got there by sunset the next day. One thing I wanted to do uh, in uh, taking on the Spartathlon is I only wanted to use those foods the ancient Hemerodrome had access to when they were running 2,500 years ago. So I ate uh, olives, figs, uh, this is cured meat, kind of a beef jerky, and something they call pastilli, which is a ground sesame seed honey paste. I also only drank uh, water, no, no electrolyte replenish or sports beverages, uh, to try to reproduce what he might have gone through. Um, there are aid stations set up along the way, and I thought it was really, um, uh, very Greek that a lot of the volunteers, you know, were having a hard time supporting their families uh, be because of the economic situation in Greece, yet they'd come out and support all of us runners as we're running down their streets. Um, they had pitchers of water that you could, you know, like yesterday, where you can kind of sponge off. Unfortunately, the water is warm. There was no ice, so it was almost like a sauna. It was almost deleterious to put the water on you, but I just felt kind of obligated uh, because they were there servicing us. Another thing that really surprised me during the Spartathlon is even though there were 350 of us at the start, uh, the field spreads out very quickly. So I ran, I would say, over 80% of that 153 miles all by myself. You know, when you, when you run 153 miles, you know, how many days does it take? Where are the hotels? Where do you sleep? Uh, and the answer is you, you don't. You just keep running for 36 hours. Uh, straight through the night. Um, you just put on a head, uh, headlamp uh, and you keep going. That checkpoint I was running into was about um, mile uh, 115 and I was refueling here on some more figs. So at this point I'd been eating figs for about 17 hours. And I was, right when I left that, uh, that checkpoint, I was going to scale something called Mount Parthenian. And if you see, this is an altitude profile of a, of a course. So this is looking at what you've got to climb. Um, the red line below is the, the Boston Marathon, Heartbreak Hill, they call it. <laughs> Super. <laughs> so I ran Boston Marathon uh, the Monday before the London Marathon. Uh, and I'll tell you, Heartbreak Hill felt like a speed bump to me after climbing Mount Parthenian. So it's a 3,000 foot climb in about a two mile stretch. 
and that's the equivalent of about three Empire State Buildings uh, straight up into the sky. Um, it's 15 mile stretch from one side to the next checkpoint and in those 15 hours, this is as I came down the far side, uh, it, in 15 miles it took me five hours to cover 15 miles and I was moving as quickly as I could. My heart rate was almost max for that entire five hours and all I covered in that duration was 15 miles because it was so treacherous up on this mountain. And here's a view as the night turned to day the next morning. Um, you can see the mountain in the background. The one unique thing with the Spartathlon in that it's like no other race on earth because there's no finish line. <laughs> I mean, how many of you have done a race where there's no finish line? Um, you run with a timing chip and you're going across timing mats, so they're recording your time the entire way. But in the main square of Sparta is this towering bronze statue of King Leonidas, you know, the king, this is Sparta. And what you do to finish this race is you run up to the king's feet, his, this bronze statue, and you touch his feet. And when you touch his feet, they stop the clock and your race is done. So here's a shot of me touching his feet at the very finish. Um, it's, a, it's a hugely emotional moment that's standing below because you've been out there just battling the elements, battling yourself, battling your mind. Uh, and when you get to Sparta, uh, it's, it's such a beautiful moment. And every, every single runner I saw touch his feet, just, you just melt. Um, it's, you get the chills. And it was just an incredible experience. Uh, here's another perspective. Um, after the race, there's a mandatory medical check. And I've never seen, I've been to a lot of medical checks at the end of races, I've never seen anything like this place. I mean, it was, there were more IV bags uh, in there than grapes on a, on a vine. Um, people were in legs, I mean, people had broken their legs, they're in splints. It was really quite a traumatic scene. Uh, but I checked out just fine. And um, having explored this area a bit and knowing uh, Greece, I knew that what do you do after a race like this? in Greece. It's Greece, right? Why am I running 153 miles through the mountains? Go to the beach. <laughs> so I hit, I hit the coastline right after that. And that is the uh, U.S. cover uh, of my book. So you've got uh, the U.K. cover, which I think is, is a much... Well, look at... If you have a book in front of you, look at the covers. Which one do you prefer? U.S.? Oh, no. <laughs> my publisher's here. <laughs> Um, but I think I'll end by explaining why the marathon is not 24.8 miles as the run from... Well, let me, let me go on with the full story. So, Fidipides gets to Sparta, and he says to the Spartans, we're being invaded by the Persians, we need your help. The Spartans said, that's fine, we'll come to your aid. Uh, except, we can't leave because the moon is not full, and our religion forbids us from, for leaving for battle until there's a full moon. Uh, that won't be for another six days' time. So now Fidipides is sitting there thinking, wow, that's great, they're coming, but they're delayed by six days. I've got to tell my Athenian mates that are waiting at Marathon that the Spartans are on the way. They're just going to take a little bit longer to get there. So what does he do? He turns around and deadheads back. He runs back to Marathon. The battle is fought, uh, and then he ran the final, this is my version, then he ran the final uh, stretch into the Acropolis to fall dead. <laughs> he deserved to die at that point. <laughs> um, but that is, again, that's 24.8 miles. Why is the legend not the Spartathlon, this 153-mile round trip? Well, if you look back into history, in ancient Greece, there was nothing more noble than dying in the cause of your countrymen and serving your country, fulfilling your mission. And that last stretch from Marathon to the Acropolis, someone died. And that was just the most glorious story ever. Someone running 153 miles round trip, well, the guy's just a hemodrome. I mean, that's what he does for a living. He's paid to do it. You know, yeah, it was a crappy day at the office, but he just did his job. You know, he died at the end, though. That, that is Greek. Um, but uh, the marathon, uh, the modern Olympic marathon that started, the modern Olympics, which began in uh, 1896, the marathon was actually 24.8 miles. Uh, the next subsequent uh, couple Olympics, the marathon distance was 24.8 miles. 
Well, in 1908, the marathon came to London for the Summer Games. And the Queen wanted the marathon, the, which was the marquee event of the Olympics, to finish in front of the Royal Viewing Box on the Olympic track. And that was a little bit further than 24.8 miles. That was 26.2 miles. So she talked to the king and said, you know, we have to change a couple things around here with this race. We've got to make it a little bit longer. And he, of course, said, well, that's going to be a problem. I mean, these people have been running for 24.8 miles. I mean, adding another 1.4 miles, that's going to be tough to, a tough sell. And she gave him one of those looks that, you know, you men that have wives, you know what that woman, when she gives you that look, she kind of, gives you one of those, and what do you do when you, you know, your partner gives you a look like that? You say, yes, darling, anything for you. So the king issued a decree forever changing the distance of the marathon to 26.2 miles, and the rest is history. So I think that um, at the London Marathon, if you're an anarchist, at 24.8, you might as well just stop, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> And that last four, I, I just say, hail the king, right? All hail the king. We just ran that last four, 1.4. Uh, but anyway, that's the road to Sparta. Uh, the story is much more intricate. It's much more personal. Uh, it's a journey, and uh, not just about running, but about finding out who I am. And I think that's a journey that uh, all of you I encourage to take, to look back into your ancestry and, and figure, figure out what makes you, you. And that's kind of what this book is about as well. So um, the one thing I will say is that uh, I spoke about a, a gentleman that guided me through this. I'm not a historian. Um, I'm, I can barely write my name in the dirt with a stick, so I'm not even an author. But the gentleman who guided me through this book and the history, uh, Dr. Cartledge from Cambridge, uh, is here in the room. So can you please, yeah. And so I, so I think what we're going to do is open up some questions. Uh, you can ask me questions about uh, my background or any sort of historical questions um, it's a that you'll, an you'll answer the historical questions. Of course, of course. OK, we will need the mic, so <coughs> please wait for the mic. Uh, Dr. Cartledge, you will also need the mic, so I will run a bit. A couple of questions. Um, do you follow any specific diet, or do you recommend any spe specific diets for long runs. And the second question, uh, I've heard that the Kenyan people run quite a bit. They perform uh, great in the, the uh, tournaments, Olympics, and things like that. Is there anything to do with the genes, or why do, how do they do that? Yeah, so uh, do I follow a specific diet? Um, I'll tell you what not to eat while running for 36 hours. Figs. Because <laughs> I, I would train for six or eight hours eating figs, and it was, it was just fine. But when you run for 24 hours eating figs, it's not so good. I mean, why do we eat figs? Because, you know, to help our regularity. Well, when you're running for 36 hours, you don't necessarily want to be regular. So I avoid um, fibrous foods. Uh, I don't carbo-load anymore. I mean, this idea of carbo-loading used to be very popular, where you eat a lot of pasta and rice. And it just left me the next morning at the starting line feeling very bloated. So now I just stay to a very simple diet. Um, I follow what's called a, a paleo diet. So I don't eat anything that's refined or processed in a bag. Uh, if you can't pull it from a tree or you know, dig it from the, the ground uh, or catch it with your hands, I don't eat it. I have a mentor, uh, a guy by the name of Jack LaLanne, who is this, you know, one of those American fitness guys, those muscle guys. And he said, uh, if man makes it, don't eat it. And if it tastes good, spit it out. <laughs> guy sounds very Spartan to me. I can go with that. Yeah. And as for the Kenyans, I mean, I think there's a, uh, there's a number of things that, that help the Kenyans. One, um, you know, they live at altitude, so they're training at altitude. Uh, they're um, uh, from a culture of runners, so they're kind of immersed in that. They start at a very young age. Uh, they also are very driven because if they win a, a, a race, like, the London Marathon, you know, that's more money than 15 Kenyans will make their entire lifetime, and that's just one race. So um, they're very motivated in that regard as well, very hungry, and good for them. Yeah. Could I just ask, is there not yeah. a, a South American people that also, not just an African one, but does a lot of this long-distance running? 
Am I right? You yeah, mentioned in your book. Yeah, there, well, there's a couple cultures that are from long distance runners. There's one in the Copper Canyon, which were uh, Tarahumara Indians. And yeah, so some, yeah, so there's a book called Born to Run, some of you, so you know about the Tarahumara Indians. I went down and, and visited these folks, and it's the same thing. They're just from a culture of running. Uh, I said to one guy, well, you know, what's your training like? He said, well, some days I run 60 or 70 miles. I said, that's incredible. What do you do? He's like, well, I'm the mailman. <laughs> like, okay. So it's kind of culturally, yeah. Okay, so what allows you to trace the story from Feuvitis? What are the sources that allow you to know, okay, what happened or what did not happen? What do we know for sure? Can you translate? Because okay. I, that was <laughs> no, that, that, that I think, your action is strong. I think what the question was, what is the ultimate basis in terms of evidence for the run of, I call him Philippides, Dean calls him Philippides, but it comes to the same thing. And it is ultimately just a few lines, um, one chapter of uh, Herodotus. And I thought you all ought to know that this year is Herodotus' 2,500th birthday. If you believe he was born in 484 BC, BCE, why is 2017 the 2,500th anniversary of his birth? Can anybody help me with that? Because if you add together 2017 and 484, you don't get 2,500, you get 2,501. Because there's no BC naught or AD naught. So you go from BC1 to AD or CE1, and therefore you take off. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's beside the point. Uh, Herodotus was um, traveling around, um, talking to Spartans, talking to Athenians. He wasn't either a Spartan or an Athenian. He came from what's today Turkey, from Halicarnassus, Bodrum. And um, in his day, he had been born in the Persian Empire this empire that was trying to conquer mainland Greece to add to its existing territory in Asia. So he had a particular personal interest. You rightly called him the father of history. History in Greek means inquiry. History is the result of inquiry in English, but in Greek it's the process of inquiry. If you go to the Natural History Museum in London, that's the museum of the inquiry into nature. It's not the result of inquiry, it is the inquiry itself. So he inquired, why did the Greeks, the few Greeks who could agree amongst themselves for long enough, why did they win? Why did they not get wiped out, totally conquered, so on and so on. So it was partly logistics, it was partly spirit, and this is Dean's uh, main point, I think. So there's this one chapter, and he says really what Dean has said, that Philippides, or Philippides, was a hemero, or hemerodromis, or dromos, and there's a problem there. What does that mean, a day runner? Does it mean that he runs only in the day? not at night, and there are people who think that ancient Greek day runners did not run at night, whereas Dean has run three nights consecutively, and certainly everybody on the Spartathlon, and indeed Philippides, Philippides, had to run at night. Now, was that because there was a particularly good full moon? Mm, not possible. Um, it, it might be, but nevertheless, even that probably wouldn't have given enough light. I mean, it is a really puzzling thing how these guys kept going over that terrain. I've tried walking barefoot, and uh, the problem is prickles. It's not just rocks, it's the things that grow on the rocks. <laughs> Damn painful. But it's probably the case that actually Philippides, from a very young age. I imagine he comes from a family of runners. And um, as with all crafts, if you start it, you learn it from your dad, typically your dad, because this is a male, very male-dominated world. You harden your feet so it has a kind of carapace over it. You don't actually feel with your tendons the ground. You're, you're, you've got this skin carapace over your feet. Anyway, all he says is he arrived there on the second day. So more than 24 hours, we would say less than 48 hours. And so the Spartathlon averages it, gives you 36. I mean, it's a notional figure. And that's really all he says, apart from one detail, which is very ancient Greek, that at some point on his run, Philippides Philippides met a very strange creature, a being, and not entirely human, partly goat, partly horse, partly human. So human down to here, goatee legs, and a horse's tail. And his name was Pan, 
or pan, it's a long A in Greek, and that's where we get panic from. So if pan is on your side, he instills panic into the enemy. And so he addressed um, Philippides, and uh, Philippides asked him, you know, what's going on? And Pan says, you Athenians, you don't worship me yet. He came from Arcadia, and he was worshipped as a god in Arcadia. He's the son of Hermes, who's the messenger god. So he's a very useful god for travel. At any rate, Philippides obviously gets back to Athens. They win the Battle of Marathon, and this is fact. They indeed instituted a cult under the Acropolis and a rural shrine. So it's not just Herodotus making it up. You know, what a story. Philippides must have been bonkers. But we then ask, don't we, have you heard of the third man effect? Does that phrase mean you're running and you imagine you see someone? Or if you're an ancient Greek, you project it as a god and you project it in Arcadia as Pan. Did he really have a vision? Was he hallucinating? Did he really believe that he saw Pan. So that's just an idea. He's giving away all the book. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> You've got to read the book. Um, maybe you just ask, ask the question and one of you repeats it. So we have yeah, that's what this paraphrase. That, yeah, sure, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you, I don't think you, you can just talk. I think you can just, yeah, you can just speak. Uh, since you mentioned, yeah, um, since you did run a marathon barefoot, you mentioned that you wanted to run a book and that tribe. Um, about barefoot running in general uh, with regards to, I guess, like human physiology and, and what makes sense biomechanically and, uh, with modern shoe technology and, and with that and whether that's serving um, us or not. Uh, the second question, what's, what's next? <laughs> well, you know, the first question that we're talking about uh, uh, running barefoot or uh, wearing, sh you know, shoes that are overbuilt. A lot of shoes, I think, are overbuilt with structure and so forth versus running in a more natural feeling shoe. And I've always thought that barefoot running was the way we were engineered to run. Uh, as uh, Paul said, that when I looked at some of the, the runners in the Tarahumar Valley, they're, they're, the callus on the bottom of their feet were tremendous. I mean, I thought, that's, you know, it looked like almost like an elephant foot. I thought that's probably why they've got that layer. They're not feeling as much as we do. But I love to run barefoot on the beach, on the sand, or if there's a nice grass field, uh, run barefoot on the grass, and you'll see it, you tend to, you, you alter your gait. So when you run in uh, cushioned running shoes, what you typically do is you go to this heel strike pattern where you strike on your heel because there's a big EVA foam pad there and you roll off to your toe. What happens when you run barefoot is you run more either on midfoot or forefoot. So you prance along so think if you're standing on a, on a block, maybe this high, and you're, gonna, and you're barefoot and you're going to jump off, would you land on your heel? No, you'd land kind of on your forefoot area, and that's what it feels like when you run. And to me, that, that is the way we are engineered to run. It's a much more natural feeling. We tend to take shorter, choppier foot strides, so we alter our gait in that regard as well, and we uh, accentuate our arm swing. So quicker arm swing, quicker steps. Yeah. Um, what's next? Well, I'm hoping to run a marathon. I, I once ran 50 marathons in all of the 50 United States in 50 consecutive days. And I thought, yeah, you guys, you marathon, do you feel like running a marathon right now? This next, yeah. And Hawaii and, and, is a little distance. Yeah. From well, I, sw the I swam to Hawaii. The I swam. You swam yeah, yeah. to Hawaii and then you <laughs> ran it. Yeah, yeah. But I, I thought that was the ultimate road trip. So I want to um, uh, take that same footprint just globally and try to run a marathon in every country of the world in, in one year. So that's, that's my plan, is to just set out on a global expedition and run a marathon in every single country. Yeah. I think it, it, it sounds like the ultimate road trip to me. I just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Hi. So I think given that you've accomplished many times over something that many of us will never even attempt to accomplish, I think you probably have a really interesting perspective on what is possible versus what is not possible. So. One, could you share maybe some of that perspective in terms of how you think of overcoming challenges that maybe you know the average person would find really difficult to overcome? And two, I guess, does everything else in your life seem really easy? <laughs> 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 well, I mean, the first time I heard of someone running, when someone said, I'm going to run 100 miles, 
I, I, I couldn't get my head around it. I thought, you know, how many days does it take? You know, where are the campgrounds? Where are the hotels? Uh, and he said, no, the, the starting gun goes off just like at the marathon. And 100 miles later, you get to the finish line. Uh, that's how you finish the race. And it was such an expansive idea to me. I thought, that's Im I, I don't even like driving 100 miles. How can a human run 100 miles? That's impossible. And, and then I went out and did it. And I learned that um, a lot of barriers are self-constructed, at least physical barriers for me. Uh, they're, they're just barriers that I put in my own mind. I mean, uh, if someone had said to me, you know, the man five years before the man uh, ran 100 miles, could, could you possibly run 100 miles? I would say, I know, I'm incapable of that. That'd be completely out of the realm of possibility. And then I went and did it. And I thought, wow, that was, that was, that was amazing. And it proved to me I was better than what I thought I was, and I could go further than what I thought I could. And I think that lesson translates into everything with life. Uh, you can apply that to, you know, uh, to education, to your career, uh, to interpersonal relationships. Uh, you learn that a lot of things, the barriers you put in front of you are just things that, that don't really exist, that you've just conceived them yourself. Does that, does that kind of address your, yeah. Okay. Have you ever run a marathon? I only a half. I don't, I don't think I'll come to full. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, if you, the, the person that finishes that full marathon will be a different person than the one that stood at the starting line uh, that morning before the gun went off. I mean, you learn more about yourself through hardship and struggle and adversity than you do through comfort. Uh-huh. Do you follow like a training plan, plan beyond running? Like, do you run to train for running, or do you also do a whole bunch of extra cross training or something? <laughs> like, how, how do you fix all in? What do you do? Well, I, I don't do something most of you are doing right now. I, I never sit down. So my entire, my, sorry, <laughs> my entire office has been converted to standing level, and it's been that way for about the last 15 years. So I, I do all my writing, all my emails and everything standing up, typically barefoot and typically bouncing around on my toes. I have a pull-up bar in my office and a sit-up mat, and throughout the course of the day, I have this what's called HIT training, high-intensity interval training. So there's sets of push-ups, pull-ups, uh, dips, uh, and something called burpees. So it's about a 12 to 15-minute routine. Your heart rate is very elevated the entire time, and I'll do maybe four or five of those um, throughout the course of the day, as, as, uh, along with running. Yeah. And when I'm really in a training block, I mean, I'll get up early, maybe 3.30 in the morning, and I like to try to run a marathon before breakfast. And so run a marathon and then go to work, you know, do the HIIT training throughout the day, and then do a shorter, maybe a 10 or 12-mile run in the afternoon, but uh, at pay, like at a, a tempo run or a pace run or, you know, or hill repeats. Does that answer your question? <laughs> go to work on a marathon. <laughs> What do you think about while running for such long times, and how do you keep yourself motivated? So what do you think about while running, and how do you stay motivated? Um, you know, running, uh, I think about a lot of things, and I think about nothing. I, the one thing I like about running is, is I'm a very strong introvert, and when I'm running, it's just I can just kind of put the world in perspective and kind of be alone with myself for a while, just to work things through and to think. Uh, I also listen to audiobooks. So I've got about 500 uh, audiobooks on my playlist. I'll listen to, I listen to probably two or three books a week, cause just while I'm running, yeah. And you know, how do I stay motivated? Uh, I always take on new challenges. So if I told you what I've done in the last month, uh, you know, I, I've run a marathon every single weekend on three different continents in the last month. Uh, I fly from here to Lisbon, uh, Portugal, I'm gonna run. <laughs> And then on Saturday, I fly to Washington, D.C. I've got a 50-mile run. Uh, the next day, uh, that night, I'm taking a red eye to California, and I have the Big Sur Marathon on Sunday. So um, I, you know, I just I, I love my craft. I love what I do. I get to see the world, and that keeps me motivated. But it's it's a very different reality than someone living in London, you know, with a day job, um, training, especially in the, in the winter. And that's why I don't live in London. I, I don't know how you do it. I <laughs> respect. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, let's yeah. How do you recover, or do you actually let your body recover? <laughs> <laughs> Recovery is overrated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I I don't stretch. I don't get massages. I don't use a foam roller. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I. I <laughs> I guess recovery is kind of, re it's relative. I mean, when I'm flying, I can't think about recovery because I'm flying so much. Uh, it just, it's, you know, I, the finish line for me is still another three weeks away because I've got the same sort of schedule for three more weeks and, um, and then I'll rest for a day or two. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh? Why all the running? <laughs> well, you saw where my ancestors come from. Yeah, maybe I'm just a modern day, uh, you know, Tell human Tell them roommate. about Ikaria, your mother's side, because they might not know about that. So, oh, yes. Yeah. So, has anyone, does anyone know about the blue zones? The, it's, the blue zones are these in, uh, areas of the world where the indigenous population lived to be the oldest and the healthiest. And my father is from uh, mainland Greece, the Peloponnese, Arcadia. Yeah, where and, yeah, Pan and, came from. And, yeah, <laughs> Pandemonium and Pandemonium panic, yeah. My, and my mother's from this island called Ikaria, which is where Icarus, you know, the guy with the wax wings, crash landed, the boy. And in Ikaria, they have more centenarians than any place on Earth, so more people that live to be 100. And I've been there a couple times, and I've gone up into these villages uh, up in the mountains, and these, these people are amazing. I mean, I remember speaking to this woman. She was 104 years old, and she was an entrepreneur. But she was very disappointed. And I said, you know, what, what's, what's the matter? She said, well, I, I walked three miles down to the bank to get a loan to build my business. And the bank said, we're sorry, we have a policy. We don't loan money to people over 103. <laughs> <laughs> so I walked three miles back up to my house, and now I have no money. <laughs> We're out of time. Uh, we're out of time. Uh, so thank you all for coming. If you want your book signed, please come to the front. And thank you very much, Dean Canazes. And, and Dr. Cartlow. <laughs>